Welcome to Everything Distributed. Today, we are going to talk about replication, especially in the case of a distributed storage or replicated storage. People also refer this area to distributed database or replicated database. And the content is based on uh, this uh, chapter five in designing data intensive application by Martin, and also a very nice uh, blog by Brian, it's called a prime, Primer on Database Replication. So usually the database is very simple to understand, like most of the research is on a single machine. So we have a machine, we have a client, they just access the database, it's a very uh, intuitive. However, what's the problem of a single machine? If you remember from this cloud computing episode, then you will remember that this a single machine is limited because both the communication and computation or even storage is a bottleneck. Okay, so like if you have tons of cloud client, they want to access the same database, then it's very easy for the machine to fail because the workload is just too large that it couldn't handle. And so people introduce the idea for distributed database. So now we have a replication. So you have a three databases or three storages. The simplest idea is that if uh, if I some client just I write something okay say I write X then you want to replicate the same piece of data X to the other machines so that later on when the other client that may access a different machine he or she can still read this data X and then that's the whole point of a distributed database. You are going to replicate data from the one machine to the other machine. So that jointly, they still behave like one database. And then at first you might think that this problem is very easy, so trivial. And in a sense, it is true if like this data X, it doesn't change over time. So suppose it's durable, and then suppose it's a movie file, it's a music file with a distinct name. So once you store there, you don't plan to change it, that's perfect. Then you can do this, and it's very easy to implement. However, it's very possible that like the, this thing, like later on this client may say that, okay, I want to change this data from X to Y, okay? then now you need to deal with a different version of data and then the, the, the problem becomes trickier okay then so in the in the case of distributed database what's the advantage the advantage the first one is a lower latency because that so for example the, the the clients here they only need to access the machines that's closer to them so suppose here is in us here's in europe and then here it's in asia then you only need to access the local data center or the data center that's closer to you and then you don't need to go all the way to suffer this like very wide area latency so that's the first one. And then similar to what we saw in cloud computing, you have a scalability. So suppose one machine can only handle 1,000 clients, then you have three machines. Ideally, you can handle like three groups of uh, clients or 3,000 clients. So your throughput increases, okay? And then the final one is called higher availability. Intuitively, what availability means is that suppose one of the machine or even one of the data uh, center just booms, it's gone, it crashes, then your system should still be functioning. You should, you are expect to still be able to handle client workloads, right? So like for example, like Facebook or Instagram, so you just assume that the service should be always on. Even though underlying the underlying system, some machine may fail, some network may fail, message may, may be lost, but as a client, as a user, you don't really care about that. All you care about is availability and latency. 
and then that's why we want to have this distributed storage distributed database because we want to make the users we want to make the clients happy okay but the biggest challenge as i told you that we saw in the example is because of this different version and then how do we coordinate those things right so in a nutshell like what coordination means is that as a user or even as an application developer that use this database we want our systems even though there are many different machines we want them to behave as a single entity okay so in this case now let's uh, look at the example again so in the previous example maybe this machine has a like, local storage say this data should belong to x this say oh no no the data should should have a value y then now you have like different uh you have inconsistency because this group of people this group of clients say it's x this group of uh uh client said it's y and then the other group said that okay actually you don't have this piece of data then now is that you have a different views of the system right and then that in the literature this is called consistency issue and then that's the thing we try to avoid okay so lots of the challenges then now and before i introduce more detail here we start with the simplest case of a database or simplest case of storage which is a key value pair so for each pair of the, the primitive data is that you have a key k and then you have some value and then this value can be any type right now we don't really care about that it can be integer it can be string it can be a binary array and then the way you think about it is that like suppose you use python or use java like lots of you like like to use hash map dictionary it's the same thing you, you access a piece of data using specify a key an api is very simple just like two of them you want to read meaning that given a key i want to read the value of uh, the corresponding value b and then write, meaning that I up, want to update the data to the newer version, and then you need to specify the key K and then the value B. And in the theory literature, actually there are tons of names referring to this kind of a simple abstraction. The first one is called read write data object because there's only two API. And then we also refer it as a register because if you think about the hardware level, that's how you specify your system a behavior right so you have one register you can say that i want to write a certain value into let's like, say register 10. so that's the same usage and uh, people usually refer it as a uh, dsn meaning that distributed shared memory so so that like, suppose that like, we still focus on this register thing but a register may be accessed by like, multiple people and then the one register may be implemented or emulated by the different machines on top of network so we have this notion of emulation okay but like for practical sense all you really need to remember is that it's a key value pair and it supports two api read and write api okay then we start with the simplest architecture called leader follower architecture and we start with an even simplification just a single leader because it's much easier to argue of course that for different kind of a, uh, workload different kind of guarantee you can have a multi-leader architecture but that it's a, a little bit more complicated to analyze okay so for single leader in the system you only have a single leader it's a distinct one and sometimes we call it master we call it primary and then you also have father sometimes we call it read replica or simply just replicas or slaves or secondaries but of course that i right now uh, i think the, the, the community say that okay actually we want to avoid the name for master and slave so i think like github or some other and and some other big tech company actually they start dropping the name of master slave but like here uh, i don't have any comment for that just i want you to know that some some terms are preferable than others and then here let's just i like, say okay we have leader follower uh 
architecture or leader replica architecture. Okay. And then the next one is the Then the flow actually is very simple. We have two APIs that we need to resolve. So for read, we can always read through the follower, but that for write, because actually the ordering of update matters a lot, right? So if you remember last time, the, the example we have is that why do we have like same version of X, same version of Y at the same time? And one reason is that we have like, we allow this kind of concurrent write to be issued. So that if you only go write, only go through the leader, that sometimes multiple leader, but indicate in this case, just a single leader, then that the ordering of all different rights can only there can only be one ordering and then that will simplify our life okay and even in this a single leader architecture we still have like two things that we can do that the one the synchronous replication is that when leaders say that hey everybody let's apply this right and then you need to wait for an egg for everyone else and then in the meantime you cannot do anything else okay and then there's a synchronous replication is kind of you issue a write but like it's a uh, best effort case so you don't really wait you just keep going to do whatever you want and in a sense for synchronous it's always blocking because you can only do one thing at a time and for asynchronous it's non-blocking because you can keep handling cases but like if like some some of the lows uh, other replica or other follower are slow, you don't really care, you just keep on going. And then of course you can be smart, uh, you can do a hybrid. So some of the follower is like doing synchronous, some of the other can do a synchronous, or like sometimes synchronous, sometimes asynchronous. Yeah, there are lots of configuration that you can use. Then it really depends on the workload or the guarantees that you want to ensure. So here's a simple examples to reinforce the idea. So for synchronous replication is that when clients say that, hey, I'm going to say for key K, I'm going to update the value to X. And then this the leader, and then this is the follower. Suppose you only have one follower. Say, okay, now I need to send or send or that forward this request to the follower. And once follower receive it, it process it right into the disk. He will tell the leader, say that, okay, I acknowledge it that I have already written this, uh, this right. Okay, so at this point, the leader received that. Okay, then you just I tell the client, say that now your data, your re write request is completed. You can trust us that uh, we remember your data. You can go do it, do other things you want. So as you can see, in this point of time, the leader cannot do anything else because I said the blocking, it needs to wait for the acknowledgement from the follower, okay? And then now the next one is for asynchronous replication. So what you do, is that okay i don't do this thing i don't do this thing because that once the leader for the x to the others you can directly tell the client say that hey i acknowledge it, i receive your your operation your request then you can move on and then in the meantime if like there's other things say why you can just like do this and then acknowledge it. So as you can see that there's a big difference between synchronous and asynchronous replication. And then there's all kinds of trade-off that we need to worry about. Okay, so that's that. Then yeah, so what kind of trade-off? Like before we discuss trade-off, we need to understand that in order, uh, when using this kind of dis distributed storage, distributed database, there are lots of different metrics that we care about. One of them obviously is the performance. Usually we measure the throughput, meaning that the number of read or write requests that you can serve per second. And we also 
uh, worry or like uh, consider about latency, meaning that when a client issue a write or read request, how long does it take for the system to complete that? Okay. And then we also think about durability, meaning that will the data be lost once you acknowledge it? Or like how about the consistency? Here for consistency, if you remember our example, is that we have different version of data and will I get a stale data or will like different clients has a different view of the system? And later on, we will talk more detail about consistency. But right now, you can think about that as a different version of data or staleness of the data. And we also have this uh, availability, meaning that under some kind of failure, maybe some of the client's requests cannot be satisfied, cannot be served, is that okay? And then once you go into real practical system, real world system, you also need to think about that uh, a development development cost and then the operation cost and then how to configure a system or that does it require certain like, special hardware, special software, all kind of stuff that we need to worry about if you want to deploy some system. And, and later on, we will see some of the trade-off, at least from a theoretical perspective. Okay. And at here, actually, I want you to think about one exercise is that now we know this synchronous replication. And now we want to connect the, the knowledge, the idea we already know. So in the framework of FLP, do you think a synchronous replication actually solves consensus? Okay, so it's not an easy question, it's a bit subtle, but like once you understand this, then you are really comfortable with the difference between the consistency, replication, and consensus. Okay, finally, we talk about no failure. So remember that our goal, or at least one of the goals for doing this replication is that even if some machine fails, we can still operate in. But like sometimes that once you have failed no or crush no, you still want to recover a lot, right? So if follower failed, it's very easy. You just replace a new machine and then all that, if that machine kind of recover, if you consider this crush recovery model, then this follower need to learn from others to really catch up. So that's called catch up recovery. But for leader failure, actually it's much more trickier to deal with. And sometimes we call the mechanism called fail over, or more precisely, at least in the theory literature, is that called leader election protocol. So the first thing you want to do is that uh, you want to detect that leader actually fail. And then the way we do it is kind of like timeout base is that we always have a heartbeat message just have between uh, each servers or each machine just tell others say that, hey, I'm still alive, I'm still alive. And if you haven't heard from me for a while, maybe I already crushed. That's how you detect leader failure. And once you detect leader failure, we need to, we have this notion of a, a leader election. And it has a two steps. The first one is that um, first, the one server or the one node that's been selected, the new leader must know it's a leader right now. And then the second step usually is that for all the other nodes to learn the identity of the new leader so that it can adjust accordingly. And then this is just a very uh, general case. There are other kind of leader election that, that doesn't really allow the follower to know or like all kind of uh, different guarantees. But like right now, just I stick with the simplest one. New leader needs to know its identity and the fo follower also need to know. Okay. And then in a sense, leader failure actually is impossible to solve and then that's a FLP result. Because and I, if you adopt the previous notion, everybody needs to know who the leader is, and then you are effectively you are effectively solving consensus, right? So due to FLP, it's impossible to solve. And then in the practical sense or in real world, we still want to have a leader because it simplifies life a lot. So lots of different kind of practical issue is that suppose you adopt a synchronous replication, then the new leader is got elected, it got selected, but like it doesn't have the most recent right. 
right? So in this case, how do you catch up? How do you learn a new value? If uh, you, don't, you don't really learn a new rights, you lose some of the data, is that fine? And then there's also the different kind of uh, the problem called split brain problem. I mean that you might have a two or more leaders that you got neglected because that I may be some of a negro delay or like some weird timeout values, then like, everybody will have a different view. Okay, so obviously that's really bad. And then the third one is more subtle, it's about performance issue. Is that what is the correct timeout or like appropriate timeout duration? Because if the timeout is too fast or too short, then you constantly like you change the leader, and then basically when you change the leader, your system is not operating. You cannot serve clients' requests, so your throughput is very ugly, very dynamic. That's usually not good. But uh, if the timeout is too long, and then you have a leader that truly fails, truly crush, then you are not able to detect it. So that's also another problem, right? Okay. So that's all I want to say. The takeaway for today is that we talk about replication. We want to know why we want to do the replication and then what are different techniques for doing replication. And then we also introduce this kind of leader follower architecture and two of them are doing synchronous replication and asynchronous replication. And that's all, thank you.